So Doctor Who has always been a political show, and I don't just mean since 2005, I mean that the second ever Doctor Who story broadcast is about a race of aliens who hate everyone who isn't them and have mutated themselves horrifically due to the after effects of a nuclear war. Terry Nation, the guy who created them, also confirmed that they were based on a, uh, nondescript German political party. And in the nearly 60 years since, we have had... A story where a sinister group of cold, unfeeling generals kidnap soldiers from across history to fight each other with very little regard for their well-being or personal freedom. A story where the Doctor tries to negotiate peace between two populations who both consider the other to be interlopers which ends with the United Nations committing genocide against them. This one was written by Malcolm Hulk, by the way, a card-carrying member of the British Communist Party. A story where the planet Peladon is considering whether or not to join the Galactic Federation right around the time that the UK was deciding whether or not to join the EU. A story where the Doctor wonders if wiping out that race of German-inspired mutants is justified or not, to quote, Do I have the right? There you go. A story where a giant parasite hanging from the ceiling controls every new station on planet Earth, instructing the populace exactly what to think and feel. A story where, without the influence of the Doctor, the UK becomes an anti-immigrant authoritarian hellhole. I see becomes. And I'll end this list by telling you about The Happiness Patrol, a 1988 story where the villain is literally Space Margaret Thatcher. I put a steak through her heart and garlic around her neck to make sure she never come back. Go to Thatcher's grave, call that the Happy Piss Patrol. Why did I write that? Ah, yes. Mental illness. Anyway, point being, Doctor Who is no stranger to getting political, and all the stories I've just cited are ones where I've used the most basic definition of political possible, i.e. direct one-to-one -one allegories of things that happen in the real world and continue to happen. I've started the video with this because I want everyone watching to be under no illusion that political does not mean some of the cast is not white men. So if you saw the title of this video and thought I was just going to rant for 20 minutes about how the SJW agenda has ruined Doctor Who forever, congratulations, you've been clickbaited. Now go away. For everyone else, yes, I am today going to be indulging in the very popular YouTube pastime of bashing Chris Chibnall, but I don't just want to reiterate points that have already been made a thousand times over. We all know by now that the 13th Doctor's personality is wildly inconsistent, her companions are featureless blank slates, and overall the writing is a noticeable step down from previous seasons. But what I haven't seen talked about as much is the show's distinctly rightward shift, how it's gone from being a usually left-wing show to... And it brings me no pleasure to report this, dear viewer. Liberal. But what does that mean, exactly? Do I have any evidence at all to back that up? By what right do I- Shh. Shh. My camera's over here. Shh. All in good time, my friends. Just grab yourself a drink. Maybe some hot chocolate. Maybe some water. Actually, you look dehydrated. Your mother and I are very concerned. And let me tell you about how one of my favourite shows fell so far. And I swear to God, if any of you make fun of me for still being a Doctor Who fan in 2022, I will come to your house and I will make you watch me cry. Let's get started. Now, I know that some viewers may be confused when I talk about left-wing and liberal politics like they're two separate things, because decades of American conservatives calling everyone to the left of them liberal has done just irreparable damage to the discourse. Great job, guys. So, in the most basic terms, you know how sometimes you see someone who describes themselves as economically conservative but socially liberal? Yeah, that's every liberal, really. They're usually characterized by a desire to make things look better on the surface by advocating for gender and race equality, LGBTQ equality, freedom of speech, all good things to advocate for, don't get me wrong. But without understanding how the systems that govern our lives reinforce and strengthen those inequalities. Ultimately, the most relevant aspect of liberalism to what we're about to discuss is the idea that capitalism can be fixed, that slapping a fresh coat of paint and a rainbow sticker across a system designed to exploit will be enough to end that exploitation. The failure to realise that all the bad stuff happening right now isn't because the system is broken, it's because it's working more efficiently than ever. That's a lot at once, isn't it? I'm sorry, I put a joke here in the edit. <laughs> now that's classic comedy. So with that freshly in your noggin, let's talk about Kablam. Kablam, the seventh episode of series 11, follows the 13th Doctor, Yaz, Ryan and Graham as they go undercover at the headquarters of Kablam, an intergalactic delivery company. You see, the Doctor ordered a fez from Kablam, but there was a note inside the package which read, Hey look, a fez from when the show was good. Do you guys remember when the show was good? Neither do we, that's why this is an 11th Doctor reference. Oh, 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 oh my god, he does it again. Yeah. Oh. No, dear viewer, I only jest. It actually says, help me, and so the Doctor and crew decide to infiltrate Kablam as new employees to find out what secrets the company is hiding. Now, first of all, a little bit of honesty. I went into this expecting Kablam to be total shit. 
Not to be too original with my opinions or anything, but I think that series 11 pretty comfortably sits as the worst series of the revival of Doctor Who. And even though I remember Kaplan being one of the better efforts, I was actually surprised to see how alright this episode is. Like, it's not too bad. I've seen worse. This is excluding the ending. This is excluding the ending, which I will get to. But pacing-wise, tone-wise, character-wise, there's nothing really major to complain about here. Probably because written by Chris Chibnall is nowhere to be seen on this episode's title card. But we know from how previous showrunners like Russell T. Davis and Stephen Moffat have spoken about how the show is run that he still has a great deal of editorial oversight here. He approves the scripts and he approves the final edits. Nothing goes to air without his approval. Or the BBC's. I will come back to that. So let's get on to the actual political themes of the episode. And if you haven't worked it out by now, Kablam is a pretty thin allegory for Amazon and the reports surrounding the very poor working conditions in its warehouses. Sorry, fulfillment centers. Just like in real life, Kablam workers are being surveilled constantly to ensure that they keep up production quotas and get those packages shipped out. Failure to do so could result in termination, which the episode makes pretty clear is a matter of life or death for the employees. You see, the Kablam warehouse is on the moon orbiting the planet Kandoka, where 90% of the population are unemployed. And this isn't made explicitly clear, but it is heavily implied that the remaining 10% all work for Kablam. There's a direct link made between this high unemployment rate and the fact that Kablam is mostly automated, therefore commenting on how automation in the real world often pushes working class people out of their jobs. And again, to praise this episode, the critique is actually pretty well done. Until the ending, don't worry, we are getting there. Anyway, long story short- oh, yeah, here's a spoiler warning for the four-year-old episode of this rapidly declining science fiction program. Our main characters discover that several employees have been going missing lately and initially suspect the human bosses are being behind it, but lo, a twist presents itself. I really just said lo in a YouTube video. F*** me. The automated Kablam system, the one that runs all the robots and the tracking messages and basically the entire shop was the one who sent the distress call to the doctor in the first place. One of the other employees is actually an infiltrator who's hacked the systems and is planning to send an army of delivery bots to homes all across Kandoka with explosive bubble wrap. Explosive bubble wrap, I hear you say? That's such a stupid ending. What has the show come to? You shut your mouth. The Farting Aliens was series one. The Scribble Monster was series two. This show has always been goofy, and the second that it starts taking itself seriously is the day they should take it off the air. Again, no, this ending is not bad because it's a little silly. It's bad because... Well... Do you guys remember someone called Carly Morgenthau? This is the only language these people understand. That's right, folks. It's time for another round of the leftist activist as a violent sociopath who's going to murder a bunch of civilians because... This is the only language these people understand. Fantastic. Wait, 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 wait a second. The Doctor is here. Champion of the downtrodden, quite the revolutionary herself in the past. Surely she will give a speech against the evils of capitalism, a rallying cry for the working class. What does she have to say? The systems aren't the problem. How people use and exploit the system, that's the problem. People like you. Yes, hello, 911. I'm really gonna do it this time. Okay, let me, let me just, uh, let's, let's recap for a second. So the doctor gets a phone call from the computer at Space Amazon, literally from the system. And she doesn't know this at first, but the computer is essentially asking her to root out someone working against the system and expose them. The big computer at Space Amazon has essentially turned the doctor into a union buster without her prior knowledge. And instead of being disgusted by this, instead of being revolted and putting things right, she gives a big speech about how the system isn't the problem. The way that people exploit the system, that's the problem. Okay, but after that, even after doing that, she shuts down Kablam, right? She makes sure once and for all that this evil company can no longer exploit their workers and maybe even sticks around long enough to ensure that those former workers have better job prospects now, right? 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 No, the, uh, the doctor, our hero, um, stands idly by while the human bosses shut down operations for a month 
and give everyone two weeks paid leave. I am not joking. We're suspending all operations for a month, pending review, and while the teammates are rebuilding dispatch. All our workers have been given two weeks paid leave, free return shuttle transport, and I'm going to propose that Kablam becomes a people-led company in future. So let's recap again, just one more time. Several workers have been murdered, a botched terrorist attack has taken place inside your warehouse, and that's your solution. Now, don't get me wrong. This is very realistic in terms of how a company like Amazon would respond to something like this. What's really baking my bollocks right now is that the doctor thinks this is an adequate solution. The same doctor who placed an entire family of aliens that were hunting him into tailor-made eternal tortures. The same doctor who tricked the Daleks into blowing up their home planet. The same doctor who burnt Space Fox News to the ground and then came back and did it again two weeks. Are you f- So this episode could have been better. Kablam identifies an issue that should be spoken about, the exploitation of workers at big companies like Amazon, and then it tells us at the end that the solution to these issues is hashtag be kind. And if you do anything even remotely aggressive in the pursuit of better labour conditions, like workers before you have done for hundreds of years, then you're nothing more than a deranged terrorist who wants to kill innocent families with explosive bubble wrap. It's actually insane how similar this is to Falcon and the Winter Soldier. It's just the same patronizing crap, but condensed to 45 minutes instead of six hours, thank God. But it stings so much more when it comes from Doctor Who, and this episode is far from the only one in Series 11 with questionable morals. Series 11 also gave us using guns is evil all the time always, so it's much better to let a giant spider slowly choke to death rather than put it out of its misery. And sealing this evil maniac in a cryopod is inhumane, but so is killing him, so I guess we'll do the first one anyway. Like, I know that Marvel and Disney are always gonna uphold the status quo at the end of the day once the Pentagon check clears, but Doctor Who in the past so often had a renegade streak. So many episodes from classic and new firmly stand on the right side of history and don't buy into this turgid both sides bad nonsense. We don't even have to look that far back to find an episode that criticizes capitalism without ending up being a spineless tacit endorsement of it. In fact, we don't even have to look back more than one season. Oh yeah, Peter Capaldi was a pretty good doctor. He was just let down by the writing. Oh, and let me guess your favorite to Ten and Rose. You love the Absorber Laugh, Scribble Monsters, the Cat Nurses, Furry. Just one dash in here really quick after that outburst and say that 10 is probably my second or third favorite doctor, but Peter Capaldi is just... born for it. Sure, just like every other doctor, he has a few dud stories. I'm not here to defend the tree one, but when he's at his best, he is unrivaled. I don't care, I'll say it right now, series 10 is the best series of the revival and a strong contender for the best series that Doctor Who has ever put out in its entire nearly 60 year history. The worst, that this series puts out, the worst episode is like a seven out of 10. But I'm not here just to gush about series 10 as much as I would love to. I just wanna focus on one of the episodes. An episode that just like Kablam, criticizes capitalism, but is light years ahead of Kablam in execution. I'm talking of course, dear viewer, about oxygen. Jamie Matheson should have been showrunner, man. He wrote the two best episodes of series eight, one of the best of series 10, which is only overshadowed by like the greatest finale in the history of New Who. His series nine one was pretty crap, but you're gonna get the guy who hasn't written an episode of the show in five years back instead, who gave us such classics as reheated third Doctor Silurian episode and the cube one. It's going to release more cubes. Boggles the mind. Anyway, oxygen. Oh, and again, Stephen Moffat's name is not on this episode, but please refer to previous diatribe about the role of the showrunner. Thank you very much. Oxygen follows the 12th Doctor, Bill Potts and Nardole as they decide to take a trip into space and end up on a mysterious mining station. They are soon separated from the TARDIS and discover that the station has no oxygen. There are suits on board the station that supply oxygen for a fee. As the Doctor puts it, Capitalism in space. And I think even having this line early on indicates that Oxygen is coming head on at the thing it wants to criticise while Kablam is still using euphemisms like the system. It's just little things like that, you know? You know. Don't make eye contact with me, we're not mates. Our main characters also discover that everyone on board the ship is dead, barring four survivors, but their suits are still active and walking around with the corpses inside, turning this into something of a zombie scenario. You see, every suit received a terminate organic component order at the same time and did so. The four that survived were doing repairs in an area off the main grid when it happened. If one of the suits touches you, they transfer the kill order and your suit zaps you. 
And I know I said that I only really wanted to talk about the politics of these episodes rather than the wider quality of the writing, but I just have to touch on it for a second because there's such a gulf here. Again, Kablam is an awful, but I think one of the main issues with it is that there's a lack of any real peril for most of it, even with the creepy robots knocking about and the mysterious disappearances. It's probably because the Doctor and friends all go there by choice and for most of the first half of the story are all just kind of prodding around in their separate areas. Oxygen starts with a creepy space station with a zombie on it and then the oxygen gets sucked out and then our main characters have to limit their breathing or they'll die and then Bill's suit malfunctions and then the Doctor goes blind. This episode knows how to ratchet up the tension at every turn. It's genuinely exciting. Tossing the fact that the dynamic between 12 Bill and Nardole is just so much more compelling than the dynamic between 13 and her companions and there's just no competition here. Okay, gushing about writing over, back to the politics. So the big mystery throughout Oxygen is who exactly sent the kill humans order to the suits. Was it a malevolent hacker? Maybe someone trying to pull off a heist? No, neither of these things. And if you've been paying attention, you've probably been able to work it out already. Royalty free drum roll, please. It was. The company! Deliberately killing its workers because they have become inefficient and therefore unprofitable. No, how could this be? This would never happen in real life. Yep, the mining company that everyone on the station worked for decided to kill all its workers because they had been falling behind productivity-wise and costing them money. I mean, would you look at that? An allegorical commentary on the callousness and consequences of automation in the workplace that's actually good. I'm shocked. Simply shocked. Look at how shocked I am. Once the Doctor works out what the company has done, he links the vital signs of the remaining alive people into the coolant system of the station's nuclear reactor using... I don't know, some computer stuff. Do I look like a nerd? Tell me in the comments. <laughs> so now if the suits kill them, the coolant will malfunction and the whole station will blow up, which means it's now more expensive to kill the remaining crew than it is to keep them alive. The Doctor manipulates the greed of capitalism against itself to save everyone. Well, apart from the 36 or so people who were killed before he showed up, but that's one of the better ratios for a Doctor Who episode, so... The ending, admittedly, is slightly trite. The Doctor drops the two crew members back at the company's head office so they can make a complaint and this supposedly brings about the end of capitalism forever and ever. Which I will forgive the episode for because one, it has to wrap things up pretty quickly at this point and two, it treats the end of capitalism forever as a good thing which is a lot more than I can say for Kablam. I mean you can see what I was getting at right? How much better this episode is than the other one? How it criticizes capitalism, tells an exciting story and all without dropping to its knees in the last 10 minutes to deep throat Bezos's boots? Let me just compare one more time. Let me just really drive the point home for you guys. Let's hear that big doctor monologue at the climax of Kablam again. Systems aren't the problem. How people use and exploit the system. That's the problem. Thank you. Dreadful. And now for Oxygen. The end point of capitalism. Bottom line, where human life has no value at all. We're fighting an algorithm. A spreadsheet. Like every worker everywhere. We're fighting the suits. Mwah. Sest Manifique. This also confirms that absolutely no one at the BBC was watching Series 10. No one in general was watching Series 10. I think I'm one of six people that watched it on broadcast. Speaking of the BBC, I know I said I would come back to how much oversight they seem to have over this show, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot to come back to. The BBC does have a history of screwing with Doctor Who, but there's really nothing here to indicate that they put their foot down and insisted that Chibnall just do an Amazon advert. There were no major staffing shakeups between series 10 and 11 apart from a guy who literally used to be a producer in the RTD era being made head of drama commissioning. So feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that the blame here lies solely with the creative team. And look, I don't know Chris Chimnall on a personal level at all. Maybe he's secretly a radical Maoist that has to keep it all under wraps lest the shambling corpse of Sidney Newman rise from the deep to take vengeance upon him. What a disrespectful image to conjure up. I just want to end by saying that I think a huge reason why there's such a lack of interest in the show these days compared to the RTD era and some of Moffat's is this ideological wishy-washiness for lack of a much better hyphenated two words. Because as I've said and continues to say, liberals don't really believe in anything. They'll repeat buzzwords and throw out vague ideas and goals to aspire to that sound good, but when the solutions to those problems are anything more complicated than hold hands and sing Good Morning Starshine, they'd rather maintain the status quo than see anything fundamentally change. And a liberal, or at least someone who greenlights stories with fundamentally liberal political ideas is running Doctor Who, a show about change. This is what you get. I don't think I can put it any more simply than that. 
So we heard a lot today about how bad Amazon is, but there's one part of the service that I don't mind so much, and that's today's sponsor, Audible. Audible isn't NAS. <laughs> I had you going for a second. I had you going. You really thought. Uh, no, I'm sponsored by the, uh, the fucking uh, Zabi. That should alienate half of you. Good night, everybody.